All right, we're going to have a conversation today uh, about mission statements. And uh, we've had this conversation on podcasts and in various forms yeah. at Village 101. But uh, what I want to do to kind of start our conversation is maybe elevate it a little bit and talk about the importance of having clarity around your approach, like yeah. uh, specifically your approach to making disciples. So I'm going to ask kind of a softball question. Um, if, if we were to kind of walk through the scripture and understand the biblical story, and condense it down to this. God's people are to what? Um, what's the mission of the church? Who wants to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in. I, I think the mission of the church is to make disciples. Okay. Who then make disciples. Okay, so we're making disciples who make disciples. It's kind of this idea of replication. We see that in Matthew 28, where it's condensed down in this great commission. We also have the great commandment, that we're to love one another and love the Lord our God. And these things come together in kind of from a high level forming what God's people are to be about. Um, and then, Ken, what's the mission here at the Village Church? We kind of bring it down a yep. little bit. So we've stated as we exist to bring glory to God by making disciples. So we're right there when we say through gospel-centered worship, community service and multiplication is how we're doing that. Yeah. And the reason I think it's important to talk about the how, like our approach is um, the analogy that I've used in the past is, is the Winchester Mansion, which is this place out in California. Um, it's kind of a novelty uh, historical site now, but back in the day in the 1800s, a lady by the name of Sarah Winchester uh, got this windfall inheritance after her husband passed and uh, he happened to own uh, Winchester repeating arms. And so there was this curse pronounced over her, long story short, short uh, that, that she was told, hey, um, you're going to be haunted by spirits that will taunt you um, because your husband formed a company that, uh, you know, led to people right. dying. Yeah. And uh, the way that you can stop or appease these spirits is, uh, it's kind of a strange story, but is by building a home. And so what she does is she just builds this house. And she builds this house out in California with no architect, with no plan, with no design, because her intent was just to keep building, yeah. right? And, and what you have now in this Winchester mansion is an odd, strange, eclectic, unique, may not even be a good word, yeah. um, house. You have stairwells that lead to, to nothing. You have doors that open to nothing, windows that look out to nowhere. Um, and I just, I just wonder, how many churches and organizations have not considered what they're trying to accomplish right. and they just stay busy building, right? Yeah. And in the busyness of building, if you step back after 30 years, by the way, Sarah Winchester built this house nonstop for like 30 continuous years, it's crazy. Um, but I wonder if churches kind of step back and see, now what have we built here? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. What, what is a disciple? And you've, you've got this kind of Frankenstein mi mixing and mashing together of programs and attempts and initiatives and all of these things that don't really fit in a synergistic way of how we're going about making disciples. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question. Do you think it's important that we have an approach to making disciples? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. The short answer is, is yes, but I, I think one of the things, um, and I don't know that we've planned on talking about, but I think context matters on that too. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some questions around contextualization, whereas uh, if I think about how we've chosen to go about trying to fulfill this mission here, it'd probably look very different here than it would say um, at Eric Mason's church in inner city Philly, where there's a different set of value systems. And there's a, so I know him and I've had a conversation about like we, we're big on group life and group life in the homes of people. And, and Eric would argue that would never work where he is right. because in that socioeconomic demographic that, that you don't want people in your home either because you don't want them to see how you live or you're anxious that they might take something from you. And so he, he was like, we, groups in homes would never work here. So uh, I, I wanna just say that so we can kind of mm -hmm. remind everybody watching this that there's a real danger in going, ooh, I like the way that church is doing this. Let yeah. me take this and exactly. add it here. That, there, there might be some validity in that, but I think knowing your context is super important about how you approach um, kind of your philosophy around making disciples. Well, and I mean, the other thing that we're always up against here is scalability. Yeah. Just, the, just the sheer number of people that we're dealing with has, has impacted how we think about yeah. discipleship. <laughs> um, how are we able to do this for the number of people that we have? What are the most effective mechanisms for that? 
I know the questions I get a lot of times around how we do classes or how the Institute is doing things um, are, are coming from churches that are looking for how they can take that and transplant it into a church of 300 or 500. And so it's really important to be listening for principles instead of, yeah. you know, and then asking what's the practice that best fits that uh, in, in my context. And I'd say one more thing. So just to use a, a cultural example of Simon Sinek, who's just a thought leader and yep. he uses the why, how, what model. Mm -hmm. He starts with why. And I love just to put meat on, on that, that he talks about with Apple. Um, a lot of companies were starting, when you think about MP3 players, thinking about that in the early 2000s with the what. So it was mm -hmm. just, how do we create uh, this music player? But what Apple did, what Steve Jobs did, he started with the why. It's like, why, why, why do we listen to music? And so it's to dream, it's to think differently, to use their, their slogan, <laughs> it's to, to create. So that was the why, and then it's like, well, how will we do that? Well, mm -hmm. people need to be able to do that while they're moving around. It needs to be, we need to be able to be inspired as we move. Okay, well then, with the why and the how, then it's what will that be? Right. And then you got to what the iPod was. But he just makes the point that so many companies are, can start with the what. Like, well, we just need, somebody else has this music player, so we need a MP3 music player. And it really does start with the why and lead to the how. So. That's great. Um, and I feel like we kind of walk backwards into that yeah. uh, as a church is, is yeah. uh, several years ago, started asking some of those fundamental uh, questions. Not because we didn't necessarily know the answer, but we wanted to no longer assume them, and, yeah. but make them a little bit more explicit. So we, did, we said, why do we exist? You know, why is there something instead of nothing? And we, we answered that question. Um, why did God create? And we answered that question. And really use that to kind of build a framework starting again really high and then moving down into our space, understanding our context, understanding who's here, what this place is about, and then built out the how. Um, but I think it's important, and, and Jen touched on this a little bit, as we think about what is a disciple? Right. If we're, to, if we're to make disciples, okay, what is a disciple? And uh, if we don't know what we're building, then anything will do. But if we've been called to specifically make disciples, um, let's just roundtable that just briefly. Yeah. What is a disciple? Well, the, the process was, was one of us sitting down and saying, what does it look like to be a maturing follower mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ? And so uh, we started coming up with these, these pictures. And at the time, I think all of our kids, well, in, that were in the room at that time. Yeah. They were very little. Uh, and so we said, okay, what does it look like if, if we were to take Audrey or we were to take Lily yeah. or we were to take the, one of the children there, like Shay Sumlin's uh, daughters, what, what does it look like for them to be 30, 35 and for us to look at them and go, you know what? They, we, we've done what God's called yeah. us to do in shaping, encouraging, mm -hmm. building and the spirit by the grace of God has come along and blown fire onto that and wind onto that and there. And so we, we started coming um, then out of the Bible and go, okay, they're, they're worshipers. Yeah. Uh, like a disciple is someone who worships. Um, and then, man, a, a disciple is, is someone who, who serves others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're in community with others. And they're, um, I think the first time we said they're on mission, yeah. and then we, we turned it into they're multipliers. Right. Um, and, and so that, that, and then we just started envisioning, okay, if Audrey is 35 and she is in awe of Jesus, yeah worships him, loves him, her life is this act of worship, then, then she's a maturing disciple. And, and if she's found a community of faith where she's seriously embedded with other Christians, with one another, making much of the name of Jesus Christ, then we're going, okay, that, that's a maturing disciple. Mm -hmm. And if she's found her place of, hey, God's designed me uniquely, I wanna serve the body in this way, or even, I, I would say, even if, hey, there's just a need there, it's not really my passion, but I can see it's a need in the body, I wanna serve the body, so I'm gonna step into that need, then, then we would look at that and go, hey, that's a maturing disciple. And then, man, hopefully by the grace of God, uh, she's got a neighbor or some roommates, or they, and they're sharing the gospel with others, and they're showing hospitality, and so they're multiplying. Uh, and so that, we kind of looked at that, laid the, the Bible uh, across it and said that this is a maturing disciple, right. as long as the gospel's informing all these things. So these don't become boxes that have to be checked. Okay, I'm in a home group, check. Uh, okay, I'm supposed to sing and have some worship music, check. And I'm supposed to, but if we can make it driven by the gospel and informed by the gospel, then now we've got ourselves the kind of disciple that we're wanting. Okay, so y'all are, are word people. Um, and <laughs> of course, the Word of God, but I'm specifically talking about words. Mm -hmm. And our mission statement can be a little clunky. Yeah. It's a little wordy. It um, Sorry, guys. And so when we, when we formed this and created this, we said the Village Church exists to bring glory to God. 
um, by making disciples through, and then we said gospel-centered worship, gospel-centered community, gospel-centered service, and gospel-centered multiplication. <laughs> yep, exactly. Why the redundancy? Yeah. Anybody want to speak to that? And I know you don't, we don't love the redundancy, yeah. but it was in there for a reason. Sure. What was that reason? Well, I think it was in many ways representative of where the church, the big C church was at that moment. Yeah. Uh, it was a forgotten thing in many churches. Um, the idea that everything we're doing should be pushing us closer to the understanding of what we received through the sacrifice of Christ yeah. and what that implies for the rest of the years that the Lord gives us here on earth. And so uh, I, as much as we have laughed about how it's in there so many times, uh, it, it was an important thing to recover. It was something that uh, I think the church had slipped into, uh, not, not the village, but churches in general were slipping more and more into patterns of what you're describing with the Winchester house, just yeah. um, putting things in place. It was almost like more like a community center sometimes than, than a church and to say, no, 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 we, act we actually have a stated purpose here. Uh, and to figure out how do we make sure that every single thing we're doing is driven by that purpose and not by meeting a felt need right. or, um, or giving people just an excuse to get together. Yeah. Any additional yeah. thoughts on that, Kent? Well, I feel like it's also just that assumption, and this is therefore the explicit gospel and that language we were trying to use as well, of it's not, we don't want to assume it yeah. and then go from there. Mm -hmm. We just keep going back to, it has to begin and end with the gospel in mind. So, but that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, context matters. And <clears throat> we're, you know, in what Christianity Today called the center of the evangelical yeah. world. Right. Uh, which means there's a lot of activity going on that nobody really knows why we're mm -hmm. doing this activity. Yeah. And so the kind of checkbox mentality, if you grew up in church, you know, the envelope, I, I read my Bible, yeah. I'm giving, I'm, um, that, that mentality, I, I think, w was just around. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think part of the reason we wanted to do this is go, listen, if the gospel's not driving this worship, then, it's then really, yeah, kind of it's not worship. it's not the kind of worship yeah. that pleases the Lord. And if if it's a it's a man, I've, I've got to be in community, so let me sign up for a home yeah. group. Then I mean, that's not really what God has for you, and certainly not the heart that pleases Him. And so, the the redundancy was there partly because of the context we were in, absolutely the moment we were in. Yeah. yeah. But everything we were doing right there was trying to combat this kind of false notion of religious busyness right. as a means of salvation. Right. So. Okay, so I'm gonna start high again and bring it back down just to re, kind of reframe it, reset it. So we, we started asking the fundamental questions, the big why questions, and, and started narrowing that box down uh, to our context and putting rails around that so that we said, why do we exist? Why are we here? Why is there something instead of nothing? What is God primarily about? Uh, what does God call his people to do? And, and we start kind of coming down and forming and crafting an approach to making disciples. We ask the question, well, what is a disciple? This is what we're supposed to be about. Um, what is a disciple? And I've, I have just found it interesting that that question is often left out of the equation in, in most ministry approaches, just in, in churches and leaders that I've walked with and worked with, um, in asking that question, so what is a disciple? And it, it has not been in their thinking as they've designed. Uh, and, and that's, there's a miss there. And I, I'm not blaming anybody, but I do want to recapture it and say, hey, let's, let's make sure we can answer this question. And in answering that, you're probably going to land somewhere around worship community, service, and multiplication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can add or subtract. Uh, those are big buckets. But then we said, um, so a disciple is one who worships, who belongs, who serves and multiplies, okay? This is, this is what we wanna see in our people, this maturation. And what is compelling this or fueling this or moving this and informing this, conditioning this, is the gospel. So the gospel is kind of the compulsion behind our worship, uh, behind our community, behind our service and, and our multiplication. Uh, so we're not just meeting for a fantasy football league or for you know a supper club, we are meeting in and around the contours of the gospel. Uh, we're multiplying other disciples, so on and so forth. Then we put these, this kind of tag lines around this. So gospel-centered worship, 
is the fuel for discipleship. Mm -hmm. That we believe that that as worshipers, we think of John chapter four, what the Lord is seeking, he's, he's seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth, that this becomes our energy, our fuel, our passion uh, for discipleship and for the Lord. That, that community is the context for discipleship, that this is where it plays out. That service uh, is the overflow of discipleship, that as, as I am growing in my faith and my understanding, uh, of the Lord that, that I begin to overflow by making less of myself and more of others in terms of service. And that uh, multiplication is the result of discipleship. It's just what I do. I long to see Christ formed in you and in others. I long to see Christ formed uh, outside of just myself, um, that it doesn't terminate on me. And then kind of all of that came together uh, in, in we've got this statement. And then from that, flows our approach to ministry, flows the what, if you will. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Um, just as we, we kind of kind of land the plane here a little bit, but we've, we've got all of that thinking that goes into yeah. this design, and then we start answering, so what are we going to do right. in light of it? Yeah. No, I think it might be helpful just to get into that for those that are watching. They're yeah. kind of wondering what that looks like for us, but mm -hmm. it's just me. Yet, the, on, the only thing I'd add is, look, like, being on this side of this, that like this was a, this was yeah. a pretty massive gutsy move, because it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like we didn't have forty successful ministries we did. Yeah. that were going to be significantly pared down by a a more uh, an approach with more clarity. Right. Um, and so one of the one of the issues that we were facing that I think is important to to throw in here is that we we were doing men's women ministry and women's ministry and singles and college ministries and we and all of them were doing well it, it wasn't like we were like oh we got to figure out how to shut this down because it's not doing well everything was doing well and that was part of what we realized in our own winchester man mansion is that gosh we we're, we've got stairs and we're, we're going in all these directions and we're not quite sure where this staircase heads and so the, this it sounds really romantic yeah. and i'm just I want to just oh, make sure good. we just kind of lay on the table hey there was some pain involved in this oh, yeah. as we rolled that. out <laughs> Jen, do you remember anything about that? No, nope, don't no? remember anything. Well, then God has heard our prayers. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that I just don't want to be overly romantic. No, no, no. But if an existing church is watching this video yeah. and they're feeling inspired to answer these bigger questions and to narrow it down, that there were some significant pain points yep. and, and maybe even I'd be willing to say missteps yeah. uh, in the rolling out as we begin to answer the next set of questions. Let, let me ask it this way, and I'm going to ask you. Okay. Um, we did, we rolled it out, we paired ministry back, uh, we gained clarity, we aligned, we did all of those types of things uh, around this. The what became um, tighter, mm -hmm. a lot tighter. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it was too tight, mm -hmm. okay? And so we overcorrected the tightness on that. And the last few years we realized, you know what? We, if we want this maturing disciple, there are some elements that we don't have Right. that we need to add back, right. um, that we need to kind of recover and bring back. Um, the way that I've described that is, uh, I use a football analogy. Uh, Jen, Good. I may love that. Good. But um, if you know what defense you're running, what scheme you're running, then any scheme is gonna have its strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. This particular scheme had its strengths, but it also had its weaknesses. Right. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is kind of shore up those weaknesses. Jen, what did we see? Uh, what do we notice and what are we doing about it? Well, we went to um, basically placing the, the weight of discipleship on the home group, yeah. uh, which Too actually, yeah, but I mean, you know, for our context, again, that was something that was, you don't see a whole lot of. And, uh, and over time, it began to become apparent that just like pretty much every other church that in the United States, our people didn't know the Bible like they should. Yeah. And um, they had a sense of theology, but it was a, a pretty surface level sense of theology. And so we wanted to make sure that we had places where um, people were able to gather and learn in a structured environment. I mean, one of the most foundational definitions of a disciple is a learner. Yeah. And while home groups are fantastic places for community and there are forms of learning that happen there, for someone who just flat out doesn't know the Bible like they should or doesn't have a good understanding just of what orthodoxy is, yeah. we really began to see the need to put um, dedicated learning environments back in place. I mean, you know, we're not a place, again, this is a contextual thing, everything about 
our size and our location and uh, everything militates against us being able to go, hey, let's just drop Sunday school back in yes. here. You know, we're never going to be a Sunday school model church. Um, but there's no school like the old school. Like you start looking back at that and thinking, <laughs> Is that true? There's a yeah. reason, you know, that people That's for so years thought about, thought hard about how to accommodate spaces where people could just come and learn. Yeah. So we've built back out um, space for classes and uh, the training program where we're taking people through and teaching them basically seminary level instruction for, for lay leaders, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. I would have killed for something like right. that yeah. uh, 20 years ago. And so um, it's really, I think, opened up a lot of space for us to start with a clean slate yeah. and build it exactly the way that we would like to see it happen. Uh, and then, and still saying, you know what really matters? Community and being in a smaller setting yeah. with people who you're gonna go through life with. Yeah, so what we did is, is we recognized it was too tight. We kind of overcorrected, and then we, we brought it back, but we brought it back with clarity, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, those, some of those years were tough, uh, and some of those conversations were tough. Um, but I think we're a healthier church now than we were 10 years ago. Uh, and I think our approach to discipleship, uh, we have more clarity around it and more conviction around mm -hmm. it, um, which is good. And so if I could just affirm the process mm -hmm. is we learned through it, we grew through it, which is important. And, um, and not trying to pat anyone on the back, but there was, a, there was an openness and a humility present here to be willing to look yeah. and to be willing to ask the hard questions again yep. mm -hmm. and to face, you know what, maybe we did, we did move it too far. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we promised our people years ago that if, if and when we see that, we will, by God's grace, uh, fix it yeah. as best we can. And I feel like we're doing that and, yeah. and continuing to do that. So uh, if you've ever heard of the Kaizen strategy, kind of this, this continuous improvement, that we're always wanting that this doesn't become something that just hangs on a wall or a document uh, that's on a website, but it is something that we're interacting with. We're checking it against our context, checking it against our culture, and being willing to flex in such a way that we're asking the question, what is the best approach yeah. for us to make disciples? Uh, because that, that's what God has called us to do. And so again, we started really high and kind of moved it down uh, to where we find ourselves at the village, realized, man, that was a bit too tight, and spread it back out a little bit. And so we find ourselves here now asking some of those questions, feeling good about this and mm -hmm. trusting that if we have this conversation three or four years from now, we'll be in a different spot yeah. right. um, and being willing to adjust. So thank you all yeah. uh, for this conversation. I hope it's helpful. Always. Yeah.